actually the, the decisive lobbying is often with, with cabinet and with ministers. So again, it's, it's, it's important that they are involved in the process. Last year, IBPR had a conference on open data and access to information about a year ago. Um, and we struggled really to get um, government, senior government involvement in that. So, um, Tom Alwendo was the most senior figure. So I think it's, it's crucial that the um, Minister of Information is involved in listening to the views that are expressed through this workshop, but also the next two days of conferencing. Um, and I just mentioned that the lobbying of MPs, which, which is important because you, you do find that MPs, particularly in the National Assembly, you know, they feel, they, they, they feel a little bit weird when they're approached, say, by a civil society group because it hardly ever happens. These people are not um, sitting in constituencies, they're on a party list system, so they don't go back to their areas and, 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 and talk to people or groups, and uh, um, a lot of groups wouldn't think necessarily of, of, of contacting them to say, we'd like you to think about this particular bill. Having said that, so we've tried to do that with the um, National Assembly MPs. Um, last week I emailed um, the 10 members of the Constitutional Legal Affairs uh, Committee of the National Assembly and uh, using their parliamentary um, email addresses that are on the Parliament website, of the 10 members, seven of those emails bounced back with uh, email addresses that weren't working. So um, contacting them can be a problem because they're not in the, often in the offices of Parliament, they're not usually contactable by a, a email. Okay, I think I've talked for enough, but the, the implication of what I'm saying is that um, if you want to win policy changes, um, you also have to, as has been said already, um, you, know, you have to want to have greater information in the public realm, and you need to be demanding it already. Um, so journalists shouldn't give up, they should keep trying and, and persevering, as, such, as should researchers. And uh, the more we enter into dialogue with the officials and say, look, why are you keeping this information back? It's not uh, damaging to anyone, it's in the public interest that it's released. Um, we need to keep that sort of uh, pressure on as well. Um, so the more and more data becomes accessible, even as we discuss an ATI law in the more, we hope, short to medium term as well. Um, and we need to ensure that there's a broad alliance of people, and hopefully these people will be represented at the conference of the next few days. But the academic community, researchers, the media, business, civil society, government officials, and, and, and more, uh, you know, have to recognize the importance of openness uh, in general, but in, particularly in government, and, and, and then the follow-on issues that come from access to information. Um, So I think on that note, I'll end off. I don't know how we're doing for time. Are we? Yeah, we're ten, minutes. ten minutes. So I think if there's any anybody who would, would like to just raise any points or questions, I see you, Robin, um, and gentlemen back. So see the mic again. So is that you? Uh, thank you for that very comprehensive, quick overview. Uh, I don't know whether it's my impression or it's, uh, you seem to kind of wave off the private members bill track and, and I'm wondering whether I misread that because for me it seems to be a very important opportunity to influence the process. Uh, much more effectively than relying on uh, members of the executive or executive institutions. They tend to be more protective uh, than members of parliament who don't um, see it impacting much more directly on them. And I'm wondering, you also mentioned the fact that uh, um, not a lot of uh, private members' bills come up, and I'm wondering whether that is because it's not um, an effective process or uh, members of parliament are just too busy or too lazy to develop uh, bills themselves, in which case uh, they become uh, ready-made materials for civil society to push through a lot of ideas. Because in Nigeria, that's, that's the track we went through. We went through a private member's uh, uh, bills process. And that made it easier for us to get a fairly good legislation 
uh, in Ghana, where they came through the executive process, civil society has been struggling to change one one section or one phrase in, in the bill for for years uh, to very little effect. And I think in Kenya as well, we had a situation where they used the private members' process to challenge the government actually to take the the, the matter much more seriously because the government was food dragging and by introducing the private member's bill, the government had to respond to that and put forward its own bill. And I think it's the same process we've had in Tanzania. So I, I think sometimes you see these uh, uh, start-stop processes from the executive and using a private member's bill can be uh, a very effective way of uh, challenging them. So I, I wonder if you could uh, speak to that and elaborate a little bit more on how the private members uh, process works. Thank you. Yeah, um, as I said, it hasn't been a system that's been used. And I think one of the reasons is that the movie is this one party dominant state. So you have a two thirds majority of the ruling party, and that, they've had that two thirds majority since 1994. Um, so you will not get a uh, private members' bill coming out of the ruling uh, party MPs because. They very much feel they have to toe the party line and the executive line. In, in the Mibin system, you, you don't get really sort of MP, many MPs who will um, operate sort of on their own and, and speak uh, maybe sometimes against certain government policies or suggest their own bills. And then on, on the other side, we have quite a weak opposition. Um, so um, you would think maybe the opposition would use private members' bills to uh, raise issues and to create public awareness around issues and public support. Um, but the evidence so far is that they haven't really done that. Um, and I think civil society is probably nervous about going to an opposition MP and uh, saying to them, can, can they sponsor a private member's bill? Because they would then be seen as anti ruling party and it could, could be um, detrimental to their cause. It could be shot down immediately. So most civil society groups would try to engage the process at another point, uh, perhaps lobbying the executive directly. I don't know if there's ever views on that, but uh, certainly the private, private members' bill, bills have not taken off in Namibia. Um, we have a very small parliament, only 72 members, um, and also they are elected by party lists, so they don't come from constituencies. So that issue of party loyalty is very crucial in, in the National Assembly, particularly for the ruling party members. So very few of them feel like they can step out of line. And as I say, the opposition, historically, if you read the Namibian newspapers, the opposition are generally weak and involved in a lot of infighting. And you know, if you read at the moment, I think some of the papers today are talking about the official opposition is now sort of looks like it's split into two parts. And they're already a small party uh, with only a handful of MPs in the parliament. So um, I think that possibly partly explains. Um, there was another question on this side, Veronica. Yeah, really just uh, what I was going to say was arising from the previous speaker, but I was going to put it from the opposite point of view. From what you are saying is we definitely need to have the support of the ruling party in order to, to move this bill forward. Um, and you mentioned earlier about conference participation, and it is always a worrying factor. And looking through the list of speakers again, I see Honorable Joel Panda, but he's you know just going to open the workshop and will probably flee, as they normally do. And I see somebody from the Ministry of, uh, of ICT We're talking about more information technology. And I, and I don't see, to be honest, the movers and shakers that we need in, in, in Parliament to move this process forward. And I'm also wondering, you spoke about the lobbying process, and I think something kind of was there between the lines, but I think we need to stress it. I think the media can play a very important role in A, bringing this issue to the fore, you know, making it uh, you know, something that appears every day in newspapers and every day on television. So. We, we start, you know, conscientizing society and, and you know, also MPs to, to see how important this legislation uh, uh, would, would be. Um, and it was also interesting, you spoke about the public participation, which I also find very interesting. And I remember there's one you left out, but I remember some of my former comrades and colleagues from NBC even were there, which was the drugs bill, because they felt very strongly that the smoking of Dacha should be allowed in the media for religious I remember it was religious reasons because some of them were Rastafarian. So that was another, but it was a good example for me of how hopefully we can get to that stage where this kind of legislation uh, you know, receives that public participation. I think we also need to address the fears 
we touched on them right at the beginning. And when we hear those statements, and when you hear what parliamentarians and ministers are saying, there's obviously a lot of fear that such legislation would kind of open some terrible floodgates and, 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 and they would be exposed and, and terrible information would come up that would compromise them, etc. So we have to understand where they are coming from and we have to somehow address, I think, those fears as well. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. I think the opportunity that comes out of this conference is that we can create a channel of dialogue with the, with the top people in government. That's what we're seeking to do because this action campaign is so for once, it's not just a two-day or three-day event. We're, we're seeking to build a campaign out of this and, and bring more people in and, uh, and then consistently engage with the top levels of government to discuss this. So I know the minister was briefed and the, and the prime minister was briefed about this whole conference probably two, or two months ago now. And uh, that was the idea that we wouldn't just want them to just come and make an official speech and go. They may do that, but we'll be going back to them uh, with the recommendations of this conference and saying, look, we, we, we need to sit down, we need to discuss this, and there's a, a process in place. So hopefully that's the different dynamic that may would take this issue forward in Namibia rather uh, than just letting it lie again. But I think uh, I've used my allotted time, so I'll end up and just thank you for that. In this session, uh, the time will be looking at the legal framework, the information and the legal framework and access to information. So, even though we did say it earlier, uh, that this is more than just about freedom of information legislation, but sometimes it's important to be aware of what some of the protections are, what are the, the, the legal support systems that exists on, on, on access to information. Mm -hmm. So this session will look at some of those uh, in a bit more detail. Thank you, Ruth Lavi. Um, yeah, so in this session we're just going to look at maybe just some of the international and regional obligations that Namibia currently has in terms of access to information. Um, and also just to give you and some more information about um, a campaign which has been running now on the continent called the African Platform on Access to Information. Um, so I think we've, we've talked a lot today about um, the fact that um, maybe certainly you need some kind of legal framework in place in terms of access to information. Um, but I think we really should note that Namibia is a modest country. Um, therefore, any international agreements um, that it signs immediately um, come into law here in Namibia. Um, so, if any of you are familiar with the, the constitution of Namibia, under section 144, um, it basically states that unless otherwise provided by this constitution or act of parliament, the general rules of public international law and international agreements binding upon Namibia under the constitution <coughs> shall, shall form part of the law. Um, so, what type of international obligations do Namibia have? Um, again, as I said, it's a modest country, um, so what kind of um, um, international laws do apply to Namibia? Um, so I think the first one that we would look at is Article 19 um, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and in terms of that, um, Melanie, you're also going to give some information on this. Um, but just in terms of that, um, I'm sure most of you are aware of it, that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression and the right includes um, the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media. Sorry, Karen, can you stand here? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so regardless of frontiers. Um, also, in terms of the International Covenant on Human and People's Rights, um, you've got Article 19.2. Um, again, which um, asks all states to take the necessary steps to adopt such laws or such measures as may be necessary to give effect to the rights recognized in the present covenant. Um, and in terms of that, um, you have access to information and it says that everybody should have the right to freedom of expression, the right to include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally in writing or in print. 
Um, so also just in terms of the regional obligations, um, obviously we've got Article 9.2 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, um, which says that every individual shall have the right to express and disseminate his opinions before the law. Um, also, um, in terms of the um, the Article 9 of the, the Convention of the Declaration of Principles of Freedom of Expression in Africa, um, you also have the right to um, the right to to access to information. Um, also, um, just in terms of some of um, Namibia's um, obligations um, in terms of combating corruption. Um, there are also a number of obligations which Namibia has. Um, you have the um, Article 9 of the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption, which requires state parties to adopt legislation um, to give effect to the right of access to information, um, which is required to assist in the fight against corruption. And then also Namibia actually was one of the first signatories to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Um, and Article 10A of that, and provides that procedures or regulations allowing members of the general public to obtain for appropriate information on the organization, functioning, and decision-making processes of its public administration, and which you regard for the protection of privacy and personal data on decisions and legal acts that concern members of the public. Um, so, McLean, I think you're going to go into a lot more detail just in terms of the international and regional obligations um, that Namibia has. Um, but again, as you said, if we're looking at kind of the legal framework that we want to, to navigate to Namibia, we should realize that Namibia actually has obligations to enact this legislation and also to allow um, access to information to its citizens. Um, but what I really wanted to speak to you about was um, this little booklet. I think most of you have, have it. Um, I think you've read it in the past as well, which is the um, African Platform on Access to Information Declaration. Um, this was adopted in Cape Town last year, um, in September. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background into to this campaign, um, this campaign was originally um, initiated by um, a number of groups um, which represent um, different areas of freedom of expression and access to information in Africa. Um, the groups include um, NISA, um, with OLAC, the Open Democracy Advice Centre, um, Media Rights Agenda, Highway Africa, um, Article 19, um, AFIC, the African Freedom of Information Centre, the African Editors Forum, and um, we also have IFJ. Um, and these groups kind of got together because um, it was originally called the Vintage Plus 20 campaign, um, and they got together just, um, just before the 20th anniversary of the um, Vintage Declaration, which I'm sure all of you were familiar with or um, aware of. Um, and the reason that this group got together was that they realized that 20 years after this um, declaration had come into play, that a lot of Africans were still struggling in terms of access to information. Um, over the last two decades, there's um, been a huge movement, I think, throughout the globe in terms of the number of countries um, enacting <coughs> access to information laws, but this hadn't really hit the continent. And in fact, there had only been five countries with access to information um, legislation. Um, prior to 2011. Um, so with this realization, these groups got together um, and um, what they wanted to do was to um, enact a legal instrument um, which, would, um, which would encourage countries to adopt access to information laws and they also um, wanted to um, promote a day which would be September 28th of each year which would become International Right to Know Day. And the whole purpose of Having that day was to um, was to bring um, a number of organisations together around access to information every day on this year, and to to um, mobilise these people to promote access to information on the continent. Um, so with that, um, the group kind of began began a drafting process of this document that you see here. Um, Mr. Hadetin Ojo, um, who's there at the back, um, was one of the primary drafters um, of this declaration. Um, and the declaration itself actually resulted from months of consultation. Um, I think what's quite interesting about it is that it, um, I guess, not only represents the interests of the continent in terms of access to information, but it also um, takes a very cross-sectoral approach. So, I mean, it looks at access to information on a very practical level in terms of 
um, disadvantaged communities, women, children, environmental issues, education, <coughs> health, um, and what it really does is it looks at why, why is access to information important and how can it help these sectors. And all of these sectors actually had um, quite a lot of input, input into, this, into this document. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's really useful, I think, in terms of um, any process going forward, um, just to, I think, look at, at what really were these agreed upon best practice principles in terms of access to information. Um, so this, um, this document um, was adopted in Cape Town um, last year. There was a very large conference, which I'm sure most of you again were aware of, which was the Pan-African Conference on Access to Information, um, where this, this document was adopted. Um, the campaign didn't end there. Um, the whole point, really, of, of kind of having a document like this is um, so that um, we can encourage countries to enact access to information um, laws on a national level. Because whilst this is an important document in terms of providing best principles, um, it's really important that it's domesticized and that countries actually have legislation in place that people can use. Um, so as I said, the campaign hasn't ended from there. Um, a number of the working groups um, work together in order to encourage different countries to implement access to information laws. Um, Edit, who's behind this here, was quite central in terms of um, Nigeria's access to information law. Um, then enacted, and actually in 2011, the number of countries doubled from five to 10, um, which I think was a really great achievement. And we hope that <laughs> in 2012 or maybe 2013 that Again, we'll see a huge number of countries um, enacting access to information laws. I think that the movement itself has definitely had some influence. Um, I think because of the number of different organizations involved and, and because it's really a continental initiative. I think even here in Southern Africa, we've seen some changes. Um, we were particularly concerned, I think, um, this time last year, um, that Southern Africa had become very regressive um, it was, I think, um, one of the first regions in the continent where um, there was at least three um, access to information laws in place. Um, not all of them perhaps the best, but um, it, the, the, I think originally there was a feeling that, this, that Southern Africa had really been at the forefront of this. And then I think in the past few years it was felt really that it was moving backwards, that it had become regressive. Um, we saw a lot of access to information laws kind of just sitting there. They were maybe drafted on some occasions, but nothing actually happened. Um, they've been sitting there for years. Um, we also saw some very regressive legislation um, in Southern Africa, um, in South Africa, which we also felt would have a very negative effect on the continent. Um, but I think if you look at it now, um, look here even in Namibia, where discussions have really started to open up about access to information. And, um, there has been some commitment, I think, on, on the part of government, on, on the part of the LRDC in terms of drafting new legislation. Um, I think also neighboring Botswana, um, they, <laughs> the bill was before Parliament. Um, they had drafted and um, placed a bill before Parliament. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't been adopted during this session, but it's really great to see the actual process moving forward and people speaking about it in Zambia. Um, the, the bill is due to be tabled now in September. Um, the new president of Malawi has also um, given some sort of commitment to enact legislation um, within, the next, within the next year. So I think you're starting to see movements forward. Um, and I think, again, it's really important that there is some kind of continental um, initiative that, um, you know, that organizations are working with each other from throughout the continent. Because sometimes we, I think, look at it in an isolated fashion where we feel like, OK, this is a Namibian issue. And, you know, we have to, to push through to get our access to information laws, and sometimes we forget that all of our neighboring countries maybe struggle to do the same thing. And sometimes it's really good, I think, to gain from that experience. Um, and one of the major milestones that we did have in the campaign, I think, this year was um, we had been lobbying at the African Commission of Human and People's Rights um, for them to, to support this declaration, um, and particularly as well for them to. Um, to support um, this International Right to Information Day. Um, so we were very happy, I think, at the end of April, beginning of May this year, where they issued a resolution um, which did support this um, and which, which also um, supported this Right to Information Day. 
So I think it's not only just um, civil society organizations, but also you see um, support from the African Union. Um, we've had quite a bit of support from the UN, and we're also working, I think, with a number, number of governments throughout the region. So um, I think it's, it's, it's a good example, again, of just um, different organizations working together. I think there's always been um, maybe a traditional divide between civil society and government. <coughs> and even within civil society, um, maybe somebody works on children's rights and somebody else works on gender rights, but they don't all work together around the same issue. And I think what's been really important about this campaign, and again, you'll see it, I think, within this declaration as well, is that access to information is something that affects absolutely everybody and every single human right. And it's really important that we kind of embrace as many organizations as possible because for once we're not fighting against each other to get us some sort of right recognized. We're actually working together for the same right. Um, and I think again, you know, it's really important I think for the media to kind of bring that across and to work with different organizations and to, to bring all of these ideas um, to the public. And again, I think even just to familiarize yourself with maybe what are the best practices in terms of access to information and, and let the public know that because um, I think the more people and the more individuals that work together, the more likely we are definitely to enact this type of legislation. They're going to stop talking. <laughs> wow. Over to you, Kalani. Excuse me. I don't mean to bother you all, but uh, are you all on, on time and, and okay with your turning as far as the land is concerned? Is 1 o'clock okay or is it 1.30? Just checking. I was waiting for her to come to a period. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, see you all at one. Lunch will be served in uh, the restaurant on the next floor in section one. So please remember that you belong to this family, and this family belongs to section one for life. <laughs> Is this family, what's the surname? Is it Mesa or <laughs> Action? Action Namibia. Action Namibia. So please look for Action Namibia signs. May I ask a very rookie question? This is such a rookie question. Is Namibia part of the Commonwealth? Yeah. Ah, okay. Good. So this is going to be the <laughs> Okay. Um, one of the norms, international norms that I wanted to uh, talk to you about was the communique of the Commonwealth Law Ministers, as far back as 1980, wherein this issue of access to information first got mentioned within the, the Commonwealth system, wherein law ministers made this commitment, uh, or this realization, that really public participation uh, in the democratic and government processes will only be important and effective if citizens are informed. I did mention that the whole idea of public participation in policy formulation, in, 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 in strategies formed by government for delivery of services and like development, uh, developmental projects, that the citizens will only be able to have an influence, an effective influence on whatever is being decided if they have access to information. I think this is what the Commonwealth law ministers were reflecting on as far back as 1980. And specific uh, commitments were made at the same meeting, wherein the Commonwealth was encouraging member states to regard access to information as a right, remember I did say earlier that there was this impression that this is a privilege, this is information is given on a, on a need to know basis. But here we have law ministers committed to recognizing the issue of access to information as an enforceable right. Secondly, the idea of presumption being in favor of disclosure is a very important one because 